thanks, thanks very much um, for, uh, for, for the welcome and for the, for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today. Um, this is the start of uh, the, uh, the, the post-budget tour uh, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, both sides of, uh, of politics tend to do. The government telling you how fantastic everything is and uh, the opposition telling you how terrible everything is. Um, I'll try to be, try to be a bit honest about what, what I think about it, but um, uh, let me say I'm very pleased to, uh, to be here at uh, RMIT and good to see some familiar faces uh, out here as well. As, uh, as, as they know, um, I am uh, a bit of a, uh, an infrastructure nerd. Uh, I, uh, I'm quite excited to see the whole thing going uh, in the ground uh, next to here uh, for uh, the Melbourne Metro. Uh, which is a project which uh, we had three billion dollars uh, in the 2013 budget for. Um, unfortunately, there is now zero dollars, uh, so they rounded down uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the 2014 budget as part of uh, the view that uh, that Tony Abbott, the former prime minister, had that uh, the Commonwealth had no business in the role of cities or urban policy or urban public transport. So it all went uh, here, uh, Brisbane's Cross River Rail, which uh, uh, hasn't had a hole dug yet, uh, that was number one indeed on the Infrastructure Australia priority list in 2012, um, and a range of other projects that were, were cut uh, as well uh, in Perth, uh, the rail line of the airport, light rail, um, it all went essentially in, uh, with a, uh, a, a stroke of the pen, as did the major cities unit. Um, that was pretty important, uh, as did the CEO of Infrastructure Australia, Sir Rod Eddington, obviously a dangerous radical, as a chair of Rio Tinto and member of News Corp's international board, uh, he went, and uh, as did most of the members of, uh, of, of the Infrastructure Australia board, indeed there's only one. Uh, Who's, uh, who's remained there of, uh, of the board uh, that was appointed uh, previously. Um, look, I do think though that we are in an interesting time in terms of, uh, of infrastructure and, uh, and transport. Uh, we at least had uh, in the last uh, few weeks a bit of a debate uh, about good debt, bad debt and a recognition that investment in infrastructure that produces a return to government and a return to the national economy uh, should be seen as just that, an investment, uh, not just a cost. And uh, that uh, is, I think, a, a step forward in terms of uh, the national debate uh, that should be acknowledged. Um, the truth is, though, that uh, we uh, have had, I think, in the last uh, in the last few years, a bit of a lost opportunity. Uh, we've had, we know there's a significant infrastructure deficit. We know also that in terms of uh, the capacity uh, of uh, the state, of government, to borrow, uh, we could borrow essentially capital was free. Uh, it was around about a, you could borrow at, at under two percent one stage for long-term uh, government borrowings. And it seems to me that we missed a bit of an opportunity uh, because of the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the so-called debt and deficit disaster, um, simplistic debate uh, that went on rhetorically. We missed an opportunity uh, that we had to, um, to invest and uh, we're, we're suffering for that. Um, what isn't happening at the moment from a Commonwealth level and was disappointing about the budget uh, is a pipeline of projects. There are a, a few things that, that I think characterise uh, what I tried to do as the Minister and what I think is required in terms of uh, moving forward uh, in the national interest. Uh, one is to break the nexus between the infrastructure investment cycle, which is uh, by definition long-term, 
and the political cycle, which is three or four years. And uh, so hence here in, in Melbourne this morning, I was at Southern Cross Station, uh, the venue where I got to turn the first sod on the regional rail link uh, project, the largest ever Commonwealth investment in a public transport project in Australia's history. Um, I didn't get to open it. Um, now, that doesn't, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't matter too much. Yeah, you know, because I, I, of course, as is my want, uh, gate crashed the, uh, the, the opening anyway. Uh, but, um, but the truth is, when you're sitting around a cabinet table uh, doing a budget, and person A there, Bill is there saying, um, you know, I've got this fantastic proposal and it's the 2017 budget and if we fund it this year, um, yeah, it'll be open by 2024. And then you've got Betty sitting next to him who says, I've got this great idea for a $100 handout to all Australians in marginal seats. And it'll hit their pocket just a couple of months before they vote. Then that's part of the dynamic that is real. We're dealing with real human beings. Uh, which is why we needed to uh, try and break that through the creation of an independent body at arm's length, Infrastructure Australia, that would make recommendations to government about what the priority projects are, based not upon a political map, but based upon productivity. So when we were in government, we funded 15 out of 15 projects uh, that were recommended for the priority list. And I think there are three, to me, that stand out that probably wouldn't have been funded without those recommendations. Uh, they're the Hunter Expressway, uh, which had been on the map for a long time, uh, but which uh, essentially didn't have a huge political bang for buck. It gets people to the upper Hunter uh, quicker. Uh, the main reason why it had such a high BCR was the, um, the freight movements uh, from the Hunter Valley. Uh, it uh, went through essentially safe labour seats. It wasn't a marginal seat you could point to and say this seat's going to be won, federal or state. If this is funded, so it never got funded. Um, the, the second is the Majura Parkway. Um, again, high BCR mainly because of freight essentially means that trucks don't have to go through Canberra. They go around it. Um, again, um, I don't think one is a vote, $288 million, 144 from each level of government, in the case of Hunter Expressway, um, was uh, uh, 1.45 from the Commonwealth, 200 from a reluctant New South Wales Labor government, because uh, it went through all these safe Labor state seats that they didn't have to worry about that they then lost consequent election uh, when we got thrown out, uh, showing what happens when you take it for granted for a long period of time. Um, the third is Goodwood to Torrens uh, rail freight project in Adelaide, which probably lost votes, uh, which uh, unlike the other projects, didn't go and visit a thousand times and jump up and down and point towards, because basically trains going through suburbs don't win you a lot of votes. Uh, they just annoy people and wake them up at night. Uh, and that's what uh, the, the freight system uh, in, in Adelaide uh, does, a bit like the Southern Sydney freight <coughs> line that, that runs through, through my electorate. But we did manage, I think, to break uh, that nexus, uh, which, uh, which is, I think, uh, remains um, the big challenge, the big challenge that's there. Um, we have enormous uh, challenges ahead. Um, Ken Henry, I think, said, uh, said this, in infrastructure terms, uh, in terms of the growth of 40,000 people, 400,000 people per year, um, in terms of that's the anticipated growth in Australia's population, in infrastructure terms, that's like building a new city the size of Sydney every decade, or building a new city the size of Newcastle or Canberra every year. And of course, what we know is that a large portion of those people are going to live in this great city or Sydney. That's the truth of the matter. They both grow to around about uh, around about eight million. 
There's other things that are happening as well that we should judge and we need to plan for. The ageing of the population, I think, is the, is the big one. Because that will impact in terms of the sort of housing we need, uh, the nature of the cities and the way that they function, and the way that people will get around uh, those cities uh, indeed as well. So it's a matter of managing the population growth and the demographic growth. And that's why we need, I think, to emphasise that we need to, uh, to the extent that we can, um, for the politicians, so I won't uh, ever endorse completely depoliticising things, but that in part, I think, is the key to unlocking, um, to unlocking change, uh, which, is, which is positive. And that's why we created the Infrastructure Australia model, that's why we created the Major Cities Unit, that's why we did research like um, the State of Australian Cities reports that really just brought together a whole lot of info in one place. It wasn't original research, but it brought it together in one, one place and allowed policy makers to have uh, decision, uh, uh, evidence-based decision making, um, a bit like the creation of the Infrastructure Australia Priority List, or the National Port Strategy, or the National Land Freight Strategy. All of these were just aimed at how do you get proper evidence to drive uh, that investment. The second issue that has to be dealt with is financing. As I said before, I think we have missed an opportunity, but there's still uh, some chance there. Uh, I do want to be, uh, along with uh, the business community, uh, very critical of the decision that's been confirmed in the budget to create what was originally going to be called the Infrastructure Financing Unit in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. They were smart enough to work out the acronym probably wasn't the right one of sending a message, it'll take you a minute, um, for what they were trying to do on infrastructure. So they changed it to something else, infrastructure financing policy unit or bureau or something else. But it, it's, basically, it's basically a sidelining of Infrastructure Australia. It is uh, putting a unit in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet that will recommend the way to finance projects and it's connected up with the good debt, bad debt rhetoric of the government. Of course, this is a solution looking for a problem. There is no problem of lack of financing or lack of capital for good projects in this country. We have almost $2 trillion in superannuation. Uh, we have uh, private sector capital. We have international capital, all looking for a place to invest. The problem is where to put it is the pipeline of projects, is the, the hard work on getting the planning done. Um, so it is of some concern uh, that, uh, that this uh, has been created, and not just Infrastructure Australia sidelined, but even the Department of Infrastructure has been sidelined. Uh, this unit has been funded by cutting actual investment programs that were meant for roads and railways. It's actually from the Infrastructure Investment Program in the budget, some 17 million dollars. So I think in terms of, in terms of financing, um, the truth is that state governments have been pretty good at innovative financing, as has the Commonwealth played a role in projects that, that are there to see. We negotiated with the Victorian Labor government, then the Coalition government, for this metro project. It was to be three, three and three the financing of the project, the $3 billion to come from private sector, from value capture, from, uh, we had in there um, a mix of innovative methods, including the guarantee, similar to uh, what happened with the, the Frankston bypass. Uh, you can work out ways in which you can uh, not just have solely a sole grant system. Similarly, um, the Gold Coast Light Rail project, uh, which was done, negotiated, assisted by Infrastructure Australia. That's part of what they're supposed to do already. And Gold Coast Light Rail, uh, or the G as it's called up there, um, a project required $365 million of direct investment that was to mitigate the risk 
for a project that was over a billion dollars, uh, being run, that, that rail line being run by the private sector, already having a 50%, I think it is, uh, at latest figures, um, uh, patronage above what was forecast. There's one thing that we know in this country from evidence. Every time a rail line is built, the patronage exceeds the forecast. And you can do that almost as certainly as every road that's built, the patronage forecasts are exaggerated in order to justify uh, the toll, essentially, and to, uh, to defend uh, that going forward. And of course, as the population grows, you can't move people around a city just on roads. The truth is that the key is, the key is public transport uh, amongst all the great, of the world's great cities. Uh, that's the key, uh, rather than thinking you can rely just upon roads. That then, if you want an example, um, there's a few engineers in this room, there's, there's a, the road in Sydney that is underway now, West Connex, where it has been under construction for three years and they don't know, they've started digging the hole, they just don't know where it's coming up. <laughs> um, like, it would be funny if it wasn't true. Um, a $16.7 billion project where, under construction for three years, 4,000 people working on it today at various stages, they don't know where it's coming up. And it just keeps sort of changing precisely where it is. They don't know where the dive sites are going to be as it goes through in order to dig uh, the, the tunnel for the 33 kilometres of tunnels which are being done. But it feeds off itself because the idea is the first bit, the toll will fund the second bit, will five will fund the third bit. And then, because the traffic has nowhere to go, you've got to build another bit <laughs> across the harbour, and that's called the West Harbour Tunnel, and then they've got nowhere to go south, so you've got to build another bit, the S6. And a road that began as a road to the port, which was the number one priority that was required by infrastructure in New South Wales, still doesn't go anywhere near the port. Um, you know, like there's a bit of a theme at the moment. The main <coughs> rail line between Brisbane and Melbourne doesn't go near Brisbane for either, um, which is um, rather strange <coughs> to say the least. Um, so I think in terms of in terms of the budget, I might just make some, some comments about where um, the budget was at and then happy to, happy to open, open it up. Um, in terms of the, the budget, um, Tony Abbott at least was um, truthful. He said, I don't believe in public transport. The Commonwealth doesn't invest in public transport. He said that here in Melbourne, obviously oblivious to the regional rally. Um, <laughs> or Malunga Seaford Rail Line, or Redcliffe Rail Line, or all the others that, that were Commonwealth funded per city and were led when we were in, in office. Um, but they dug in and they did cut the money. What, what has happened with this budget is this bad debt, good debt rhetoric laying the groundwork for essentially a Commonwealth withdrawal from infrastructure funding. That, that is what has happened. You have, uh, in the current financial year, $9.2 billion was supposed to be invested. The actual is 7.6, and it falls every year down to 4.2 billion by 2020-21. And uh, what they say is we're investing directly in uh, a couple of projects, uh, which they are, which are off budget. Um, the inland rail line is, I think, a good project, but off-budget projects are supposed to produce revenue. And the government's own report, done by John Anderson, uh, said that it wouldn't produce a return to capital in 50 years. It would take just to pay back the money it took for construction. That was a report to this government in 2015. Now, they for a range of other reasons, if they get it right and take it to the port, um, it is a good project. Sydney West Airport is a good project. I've campaigned for it my whole life. Um, but um, it isn't a substitute for saying you're on your own, essentially, to the states and territories. 
um, which is what's, uh, what's effectively happened. Um, Victoria um, continues to get um, under 10% of the national infrastructure budget funding uh, for the, the crime of, um, of uh, Victorians voting for Daniel Andrews' government and not supporting uh, the, the East-West proposal. Um, in WA, they've transferred some money uh, from um, the Perth Breakland project, and what the difference between the two is a bit uh, unknown. It was a bad project, just like East-West, um, but uh, they've allowed the WA government to <coughs> learn I guess from the experience in Victoria, and have allowed the, the McGowan government to uh, essentially use that money or a portion of that money to um, uh, for the Perth Metronet project, which is essentially an extension of the, the public transport uh, linkages uh, which are there. Um, I might, um, uh, rather than just say that I seem to be a uh, a, a balanced person, quote, um, the industry body, Infrastructure Partnerships Australia. Now, if you walked into Infrastructure Partnerships Australia um, and um, looked for a Labor body, you'd be very disappointed. Um, this is the top end of town. Uh, the big transurban all the big companies uh, that um, are involved in, in infrastructure that benefit from Labor governments but don't vote for them in terms of as individuals. Um, but this is what they said about the budget. Uh, foremost, the budget confirms the cut to real budgeted capital funding to its lowest level in more than a <coughs> decade, using a mix of underspend, reprofiling and narrative to cover this substantial drop in real capital expenditure. Um, I wish I'd uh, said something as eloquent in the critique of the, of the budget, but they were pretty um, critical to say the least, which is what I think people in the sector um, are, are saying um, uh, across the board. Um, IPA said this about the whole financing model as well. They said value capture and innovative finance have been talked about as the silver bullet for decades but haven't been widely implemented because they are a hard way to raise not very much money. In their view, Commonwealth Government funding support is needed for infrastructure. Commonwealth financing is not. If the budget seeks to materially increase the pace, quality and scale of national infrastructure investment, we respectfully submit that government policy needs to return to real options, which include grant funding. So I think we, um, in terms of people who are interested in urban policy and, and our cities um, need to, I think, address the issues that, that are in this budget and the gap that's there between rhetoric and reality. It is a good thing that we have a Prime Minister who says that uh, governments need to invest in our cities, as Malcolm Turnbull does. Um, but it's, that's step one. Step two is to actually do something about it. And in, in the budget, in terms of new funding, there's still not a dollar for public transport funding. Um, there is a transfer of various funds that were already in the budget for other things, um, but there's not actually a dollar of new investment. And if you look at the budget papers number two, uh, I'll, I'll conclude with this. Um, the one road that is allocated uh, new investment, so it choose a whole budget section, is um, the far north collector road uh, of $13.8 million. Now $13.8 million, as you know, gets you a couple of good roundabouts. Um, well, not, not, not that much more than that. That is the one new investment. It's not in collector, like we thought it was. Um, for two days, we thought it was, and sent people out um, saying, why should collector this road near Canberra get it? It's actually near Nowra. Um, even people in Nowra haven't heard of the far north collector road. Um, it's, a, it's a little road that runs along 
the shell open. Like it's ridiculous. And I think, um, I think in terms of uh, the hasty way the budget was put together, I reckon that my theory is that they were going to fund something for the Nowra Bridge, the crossing over the Shell Haven, which is necessary, and they didn't want to spend enough money to do that, so they came up with a SOP um, for the most marginal seat in Australia that happens to be in. Who, who would have guessed that? <laughs> um, at Gilmore. Um, so, suit the 13 million lazy ones. Um, for, uh, for this road. But even the government's own papers, if you look at the budget papers and you look at the, um, the glossy documents, you would have heard the government say $75 billion. The budget documents that they put out actually have 70 in the headlines. So somehow $5 billion just got, you know, we'll just round up to the nearest three quarters. Goodness, that's how that happened. And then you see, that money includes uh, fantasy money, uh, like the Perth Freight Link money is funded, $1.2 billion for Perth Freight Link. Then there's the $1.2 billion where they allocated that money for Perth Metronet. Then there's a different figure, somewhere else of $785 million for Perth Metronet and $350 for a highway upgrade which means that they've counted the same amount of money three times. Uh, $3 billion to Victoria is the East Westland contingency that isn't actually in the budget, but we'll just put this sort of statement out there that at some stage $3 billion might come because we said that in 2014 and we're not prepared to move on from that. But it's actually not in the budget. Like, it's a fantasy figure. Um, and. Uh, if you look at the, the actual investment, as I said, declined $4.2 billion, uh, where it declines to in 2021, not just as I say it, but as uh, the people who look at these things from a business perspective, it's, it's the lowest investment uh, since uh, the very beginning of, uh, of the Howard years um, in, the, in the 1990s. There is no figure this, this century that is uh, that low. And uh, it's precisely the opposite of what is actually uh, required uh, at this time. So thanks very much. increase the productivity and what we have is with rail futures and an examination by Professor Bill Rush and John Hirsch about doing a separate link through from the airport sunshine to the Southern Cross station which will take numerous people 38,000 I think it's an hour but it will also link up with Bendigo, Ballarat and Geelong. Now I'm going to ask you to get together with Tim Fisher and talk our Labor government in Victoria into saying this is a priority. It does not need to wait for Metro. You've talked about lending and borrowing money for infrastructure projects, build it for the futures, so my children and my grandchildren will be able to reap the benefits of the work that has been done in the 21st century, not the 20th century. The, the truth is, though, of course, that Metro is... It, it's interesting when I sort of got the job I wasn't the shadow transport minister, but the three capital cities all have very similar problems, the three east coast capitals. They need the middle bit fixed up before you can do anything else. <laughs> Truth is you can't do an airport rail line, you can't do anything unless you do the metro. Not so true. I mean well, well, yeah. in terms of fixing up the capacity of the network around the inner areas, just like the city circle in Sydney, they're doing a different way there. There are more than one way to skin a cat. Unless you fix the middle bits, 
then you have real problems getting in and out. Uh, in Brisbane, it's the second rail crossing across the river. Uh, so um, the real problem for Victoria, though, is, and, I, and I give credit to, to the Victorian government, not just because I'm here and not just because I'm obviously a loyalist, um, but the truth is that they, they are investing massively uh, in infrastructure given that the plug's been pulled out from the federal. Um, it, I mean, in New South Wales, even the asset recycling scheme that I don't think is you know, the ideal way to do public policy, but nonetheless, that's what they wanted to do. The money went to Sydney, it went to the ACT local government, you know, using some of that for the light rail. Um, but here in Vic, um, owed 1.45 billion, um, and that's owed because the whole concept of asset recycling is if you, a public company becomes private, it then pays tax, therefore the federal government gets revenue and therefore that should be passed, so that should be passed back, essentially. That's the theory which is fundamentally right. Um, they're getting ripped off. Even that, um, in last, uh, last week's budget, they got ripped off. So I know there's a, a ton of worthy projects. I'm sure I haven't heard of that one or examined that one. But I know that there are, you know, the airport rail line is an obvious no-brainer as well. Um, but you do need to fix the metro, and it's good that they are getting on with doing it by themselves. In Brisbane, I mean, it got delayed. The Cross River Rail was like ready to go. It's cheaper than the metro because it's not all underground, and that's where the big dollars come in. Um, but you know, nothing's happened in Brisbane. It's about to reach complete gridlock. One here, and then um, Seth Rose, and then three more. So let's go. Try, look, yeah. We've got a lot of questions. Please take note. No speeches. Keep it to a real question. Anthony, uh, we, we feel ripped off. <laughs> we feel ripped off because we've got Keating and Howard to both virtually agree for a full national highway connection between this state and the state of Tasmania. They're the only corridor, interstate transport corridor, that isn't even looked at by Infrastructure Australia. It's been funded, it's got federal policies dealing with national highway connections, and this whole transport corridor isn't benefiting this state nor Tasmania. It's been turned into a holiday adventure for certain Certain travellers that want to go down to Tasmania and come back again, they fly over this state, they don't drop a dollar in this state, nor many of them around Tasmania. And Labor, as well as the Coalition, are just sitting there doing nothing about this corridor because it's water and not land or, or rail or whatever it might be. Please get Will you question. change your position in relation to the National Highway Connection between our state and the state of Tasmania. If we treated uh, the Tasmanian freight equalisation scheme, <coughs> what I assume you're talking about, um, uh, if we treated that the same as we treat the National Highway Network in terms of maintenance money, etc., per kilometre, uh, it would lose money. I've had this argument with people in Tasmania um, many times. Uh, the truth is that the Tasmanian road network um, is pretty good compared with, uh, if you look at it from a per capita basis in terms of, if you look at it in terms of congestion, if you look at it on any of those criteria, and the subsidy of freight in terms of, the subsidy that goes across Bass Strait is higher than the cost that's spent on any of the national highway. That's the truth. Look, it, 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 it is I, I, I know there's an argument. Excuse me. I know there's an argument. I disagree with you. Respectfully, I disagree with you. You've already funded it, and you're not applying that money to achieve that outcome. Excuse and me. this state is losing. This is not a debate, please. Sorry, I had to say it after 20 Jeff years. Jeff Rose, please. <laughs> Anthony Jeff Rose from the Monash University Institute of Transport Studies. 
everyone in this room on a monthly basis receives accounts when we use other infrastructure, phone, electricity, water. And although there are shortcomings with those, we do see charges for the infrastructure we use. With the transport system, it's a shamozzle. Um, we, we pay a fuel excise, we pay registration fees, we pay insurance, we pay for the police in a different way even though they're on traffic work. You talked about separating decisions of infrastructure, capital development in the political process. How can we get some rationality in how we cross infrastructure? Look, it's a good question and it goes essentially back to how back to politics. And to me, in terms of road pricing and getting a rational outcome, in terms of road pricing in particular, um, rail pricing, one of the things that you do if you price infrastructure in terms of where investments should go and look at uh, a, whole, a whole cost, then rail does pretty bloody well. That's why out of the IA process. When we were doing the original legislation, there was some uh, in the Senate from a minority party um, who said, you're not, you know, you're not naming, you know, climate change and sustainability. And I was like, hang on, you know, all of those things are factored in to, to, to prices. If we had a price on carbon, it would be, of course, directly, which it was our plan at the time. Um, but um, it does pretty well out of the system. What doesn't happen well, though, is the, the inequities that are there. And to me, what I've said to people, I'm broadly, theoretically, in favour of changing road pricing. Equity, though, I'm yet to be convinced that one of the things in, I'm more familiar with Sydney than any, any other city, not surprising being from there. Um, in Sydney, precisely those people who have to drive more are those people who don't have access to public transport. Mm -hmm. Now, the Melbourne public transport system is, is, is better, but there's still some common elements there. Um, and so to me, it's, it's a sort of double, um, double price. Uh, and unless you get the double cost, unless you have options other than driving for a start, then you can't, in my mind, get a rational outcome that's equitable, that's one that, that I would support. Um, you know, the tolls in Sydney, uh, they're just starting to click with the West Connect project coming in. The, the cost will be up to, some people will be paying over $20 each way. Yeah. Right. Now, these are people who, you know, I'll give you the big hint, there aren't many sort of bank executives living in Blacktown. <laughs> um, you know, these are working class people who are living in Blacktown because they can't afford to live close to the city. And so that needs to be addressed. And the second thing that needs to be addressed, of course, is the nature of our cities and where work is available. Um, you know, changing the, the way that cities look out, not just in, um, so that the Sydney West Airport is, to me, the key to Sydney turning around a bit. Um, but second and third CBDs. Um, here, one of the things I did here in Melbourne during the election campaign was uh, provide, well, we would have provided some funds for a, a better interchange at Box Hill. You know, how you have just not everything clustered in the, in the CBDs as well. So those two things. So I'm certainly with you Theoretically, um, but I, I think the challenge is, um, you know, and you're right, the current pricing is quite irrational and it's, you know, all over the shop. Um, in part, can I say this, civil society is, is doing some pretty good things itself to address this, um, independent of the state, or, or it, in some cases in spite of or against the state. You know, car sharing is expanding faster than anyone would have anticipated it. Different forms of people changing behaviour, coming together to make rational decisions to avoid the irrational costs that are there. Um, I think we'll see a lot more of that as well. 
Krishna, your phone must go and take it even further down that tunnel. Uh, go, go, and then, yes. Yeah. Uh, and if you go down to the city university, thank you for your presentation. A number of us have done a lot of work on the idea of our cities as a series of 20 minute cities or neighbourhoods, yeah. which you picked up as a 30 minutes, I think, in the previous conversation. Oh, I've liked Under promise and over the Exactly. How do we get that idea embedded in the kind of big project funding model that Infrastructure Australia seems to be stuck on? Because it's not that kind of approach. Yeah, well, I think I sort of went off the rails a bit when um, when it all sort of changed. They had no, I'm not critical of any of the individuals involved, they had no one in charge, but you know, they started to sack someone because he talked to someone who liked the party once, um, and not have anyone replace him for almost a year. Like just complete drift. And it, uh, but the, the IA model was, was to look at that. They had to look at planning, and we set up a course the, in conjunction with that, or consistent with that, the COAG group, chaired by um, Brian Howe, uh, and the deputy chair was Lucy Turnbull. And I tried wherever possible, um, the first question I raised, Tim Fisher, I appointed Tim Fisher to the High Speed Rail Authority. I tried wherever possible. Mark Birrell, who was on the IA board, the only person with any background in politics at all on the board, was, was Mark. Um, you yeah, know, appoint people of merit who deserve to be worthy of appointment, but also try to consciously um, create things that that lasted beyond, you know, beyond the political cycles that, that come and go. Um, you know, I think it's a good thing that um, you know Malcolm Turnbull has spoken about the. I'm not sure if he said twenty or thirty. Thirty, but he included cars. Thirty as well. So he got it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well. He, he only half plagiarised. Um, <laughs> the, um, but it's a good thing in terms of that at, at least is out there. Um, and it's a matter of there being uh, a, a debate more and more. I mean, this is one thing where politicians can lead, people in this room can lead us well and are leading. Um, people, I think, are far more conscious about. Um, the cities and the nature of them. Um, it's not just an academic thing, it's more and more in um, in private discussions between people in their pubs and in their neighbourhoods. Uh, the sort of work that's happening uh, whereby the nature of communities, <coughs> um, and you can see it reflected in things like the growth of um, you know, shared cars and various things, the growth of the sort of work that's been done about uh, you know coffee shops and craft brewing and all sorts of things that are going on which are localised. People want a society so big and so fast that they want to slow it down and they want something they can relate to. Uh, you know, the growth of regional footy uh, that's going on here and in, in Sydney and stuff as well is about that sense of identity uh, that people have. Um, and, and I think um, it, it in part will be forced as well because people, it, it is not sustainable for people to spend you know, an hour and a half driving to work and an hour and a half driving home. Um, you know, something's got to give. So that is starting to hit through um, as well. In, in, in Sydney, there's a big campaign uh, about uh, championing the western suburbs of Sydney by the Daily Telegraph. Now, uh, you know, that's not out of some sort of latent, you know, socialist gene coming up through the Murdoch press. That's, that's because they know that they need to relate to the, the people in the West and that the West hasn't had a fair go in terms of resources. Um, so I think it will, it will hit through, but it, you know, it's it's taking time. It's not um, social change. I think goes like this, and then there's an occasional jump up. Uh, and I think with this, that will happen um, as well. Uh, we have a question over there. Uh, Laura Afton from 102 Mercy Public Transport Research Group, and also Transport for Victoria. Mr. 
Mr Albanese, do you see a role uh, for greater post-implementation evaluation and reporting in um, increasing account government accountability projects and therefore breaking that, um, the alignment of infrastructure funding to political cycles, as you said, and people familiar with the Grattan Institute recent reporting on cost overruns will know that this was a major recommendation. Yeah, absolutely critical. Um, I, I go a step back from that and say one of the things that we did was milestone funding as well, so that as a project's going, it gets the milestones. The ANRO, the National Audit Office recently did a report on the West Connex project I've spoken about, whereby they said in order to, because they need to get the money off, out the door, and all the common funding's already been done. It's a bit like um, what happened with East West here, where one and a half billion dollars was forwarded in advance payments. Half a million for stage two, that people didn't quite know where that was going to go, but here's half a million bucks to put in your bank account. Um, uh, the milestone payments with West Connect, when the milestones weren't met, they changed and made new milestones which had already been met in order to justify the money going forward. I mean, you, you couldn't really make it up that they'd done that. One of the things about the IA model was that part of IA's remit was to go back and do an analysis post of just what you say. Go back and see what was done well, um, cost overruns, timelines, do all of that so that you build up um, uh, you know, best practice, you, you get better at it. And the, the tragedy of, uh, of, of the breakdown in that system is that it was working. Um, the Cross River Rail project in Brisbane ended up at, at 6,000 pages of sort of work. Um, because that dynamic of going back and forward, getting it right, testing, um, getting experts to have a look at it, what's going on, it was a dynamic relationship. Um, so IA would write to state governments, say, what about this? Have you thought about this? Now, silly state governments in New South Wales, the coalition government, once that leaked one of the letters, this shows that IA is telling us they sort of missed the whole point of that dynamic that you need coming together. And, and post, um, one of the, the things that, that struck me in, I became a minister in December 2007. As we led up to the March 2008 budget, it became clear to me that the only KPI of um, uh, the Commonwealth former Department of Transport and Regional Services was, has the money got out the door? That was it. There was no assessment whether anything had been built, um, whether, so, so in part, what was happening was, you know, state governments, we woke up, one of the reasons why I tried to shift over a period of time the funding from 50-50 to 80-20, Queensland was the worst probably at this little strategy, uh, whether, no matter who was in government, was embedded in the bureaucracy, if a project was worth, uh, $500 million, and they said it was worth 800, and then bingo, we've got a saving, now we want to spend it on our pet project. And because of the nature of the thing, the money had already been given, bingo, Dave, the, the money was there. That's where the actual stage two funding that Malcolm Turnbull announced for the Gold Coast Light Rail was just the savings, money that had been in the bank uh, from Redcliffe Rail Line for 18 months was paid actually under us. So that was the difference of it. It obviously been there for, for two years. Um, but I think that's absolutely essential and that, that, you know, we're getting better at this. And that's why it's essential you have a bit of a bureaucracy as well, like IA, it doesn't have to be that, but something. Because um, politicians will come and go, but that, you need a body that'll stay and have that knowledge as well. All right, over there, and then Jackie, and then Vincent Ryan, I run a local planning business called Creating Connections, and I'm also a member of Rail Futures. Given your comment that every time a rail line is built, actually it exceeds forecast, I can't wonder if the model isn't stacked against rail, and that particularly with polling of roads, 
18 to be favoured. And so doesn't something like greenhouse gas emissions need to be a more central framework in the, the uh, assessment and uh, shouldn't projects like rail futures, and I certainly urge you to have a look at uh, what Jane's suggesting is probably one of the few groups in the state that's doing some outstanding research around rail infrastructure. I'm wondering whether you're aware of some of this stuff. But the question really is around yeah. greenhouse gas emissions being central to the assessment process. So, you know, what you're saying is actually supported where, where rail does exceed patronage. Well, the price on carbon, you know, factoring in, uh, the, the truth is now, one, one of the, the big jokes of the Australian political debate is the suggestion that the suggestion of businesses out there aren't factoring in the price of carbon. They are, of course. Uh, governments should, should as will, uh, look at the full environmental, social, economic costs of projects. Uh, what um, you shouldn't try to do, though, is to do everything through one vehicle. Um, I think that in terms of if you do that, you'll end up, you know, you get you know, a whole lot of, uh, you know, debates. If, if, if there is a price on carbon and under the CPRS, that would have been in, and history might have been a bit different if it had been passed one or two times. One of the great fallacies about the greenhouse gas debate, and I was a part of both cabinets, uh, is that the CPRS was weaker than the thing that was eventually adopted. It wasn't. The CPRS was applied to transport. And we voted for it, and we couldn't get it through the set. Um, and, you know, the, the, the model, when it came back, um, that ended up going through the Senate with the support of the minor parties, didn't have transport included. Now, Anthony's got to go at 5.30, so quick one. Yep. If you're quick, then you might get a chance. Yep. Okay, I think we're probably on the same issue too, in terms well, of I'll, federal two infrastructure. One answer. How about we yeah. that right? <laughs> Federal infrastructure funding, you, you've identified how Victoria has been shortchanged and it's applied for decades. Uh, and the question is, how do you see, I think our state government has tried everything in terms of discussions, facts, figures, and the, the business case, all of that tried the media, tried forcing it through the state budget to its conditional on federal funding. None of that has moved to, to date, although we did get some money from airport rail. Uh, what, what recommendations or what suggestions have you got to force the issue so we do get the funding that at least 50% of what's commensurate instead of 8 to 9% get 15% or 16 rather than, yeah, zero. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll second. Um, it hasn't always been the case. Victoria got more than 25% when I was the minister. And thank you for and, thank you. And, and he did that because the work that he did, his bureaucracy, frankly, was better than the New South Wales bureaucracy. He did better work. Ritual railing stacked up, the MAE stacked up, uh, we completed the certification of the Hume Highway. Uh, we did. So, it got, even without this pre moment if you look at the spending at the time, and indeed I popped some flack in New South Wales, because New South Wales didn't get um, as much, but um, it did stack up. All you can do is, is do what they've done. There's no, this is punitive. Um, it is, I think, designed um, to, got to be able to move on in politics. In WA, they moved on from freight links like gang. Um, it's now not an issue for the coalition. Uh, federally, over there, I don't think. I think they'll probably, if they're smart, they'll get some credit. Um, and, uh, you know, again, Perth freight link was a road that also didn't go to the port. Um, but I think that's the key. Airport rail is not new money. If you look at the budget, budget paper number two, um, the, it's really easy to remember these figures. Um, the amount of new money for Victoria that's in an in actual table is zero, 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 and zero over the next five years. Therefore, rather, as a part of the billion dollars that was included, I think that's double counting for the money that was there for East West. 
So there's a billion dollars, but it says at the bottom of the table, you know, this is not new money, it was already in budget. Uh, so it's for 30 million for that, you know, frankly, will be um, half a million or thereabouts for the regional rail proposals. Um, and there's a couple of other little things. Uh, and then it says 400 mil will come and talk to you, i.e. will hold it over you. Um, over what will happen with that. So there's a case for discrimination under the criteria. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was just one. Quick question. Okay, so about a month ago, Hazelwood Power Station closed. Um, obviously, that's got national implications for both um, climate policy and energy policy. But my question is more about where does the Latrobe Valley and the central Gippsland yeah. head next? Uh, I'd suggest to you that the problem if you had to pick one single transformational project that would be fix the rail service. Yeah. And so I just wonder if you could quickly comment on that and maybe uh, uh, explain to us how Labor and the government can actually help with that. I agree with you. Well, part of, of course, the regional rail proposals is that's one of the reasons why that area has been prioritised. Mm -hmm. And I would have thought in terms of prioritising that area, you've got a federal infrastructure minister who, who has the title, if not the power, um, who's the member for Gippsland. And they put forward that proposal. I don't for the life of me understand why uh, that wasn't grabbed, at least. Um, but you're right, look, there, there is, I've seen cities transform and regions transform. Newcastle, perhaps, is the best example whereby people thought Newcastle was doomed um, after the, the closure of steel. Um, it's now a vibrant city with quite a diverse economy. Um, you know, coal's still important for it, that's the truth. Um, but the university there is groundbreaking, the work they're doing on renewables, the work they're doing on the arts and culture. Uh, the work they're doing, you know, in terms of um, some high value manufacturing as well, um, is outstanding. But one of the things that is clear is that you need a plan. It doesn't just happen. And part of any good plan for any region or any city is transport planning. And uh, rail and public transport is always going to be at the centre of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we've been going for quite a bit longer, but we do have to call and stop. Thank you very much for having us here. Thank you.